Come on, baby. Up for you. And there's a strong pulley. Jesse right there. Look, there's two or three more with him. Look at here. He's mad. Come on now, I'm not gonna wear you down. job too didn't you good at thing all right it's goodbye time boy that was fun i guess of all the questions i'm asked throughout the year at sports shows fishing seminars in-store promotions on the lake by mail anglers want to know more about one particular lure more than any other it's a lure that catches more fish for more folks more consistently than any other bait at certain times of the year. You know what it is? If you said the plastic worm, you'd be correct. In the next little while, I'd like to discuss with you some helpful tips that I know will improve your plastic worm fishing tremendously. Topics we'll be discussing are worm rod actions, rigging the slip sinker worm, the slip sinker itself, the hook, the knot, the retrieve, the line, setting the hook, color, shape, and length of worm, plus much more. Throughout the warm water season, when the water temperature is above, let's say about 60 degrees, wherever you fish in this country, or any other country for that matter, where bass can be caught, the plastic worm is one of the most consistent bass producers on the market today. It's important to remember that this lure is an eye contact bait. That means it's a lure that the fish must see in order to hit it. It has practically no vibration like many other lures. Therefore, it produces best in a stained to clear water environment. What makes it such a high percentage offering is that it feels natural and it looks natural and it can be fished at all visible depths and it will follow that exact terrain of the bottom. Over and through treetops, bushes, vegetation, or over solid objects such as logs, stumps, rocks, and boulders. Here's something I think you might find interesting. About 25 years ago, a southern legislator introduced a bill to outlaw the plastic worm in his state. This lure had been around for a few years before the state senator took action, but it was proven to be so deadly on bass that one man at least feared for the continued existence of the bass. Luckily for us, the bill failed to pass, and not surprisingly, bass still abound in southern waters. The very attempt to have a lure banned or outlawed is the strongest statement that can be made for its effectiveness. As I stated earlier, probably more bass have been caught on plastic worms than any other lure man has created. Oh, look here. Woo, baby. Okay, little old job. Go up. Okay, before we get into discussion on the worm itself, let's first discuss the type of equipment used in fishing the worm, the rod, the types, the links, and the actions. Now, both spinning and bait casting tackle can be used and it really has a lot to do with personal preference. But of the two, my choice, the majority of the time, would be bait casting, simply because I've got a lot more power and control when I'm fishing it in heavy cover, let's say with line weights of 14 to 20 pound test. However, when I'm fishing, let's say smaller worms, with lighter weight lines in spring clear water with sparse cover, spinning is a ticket. When selecting a good worm rod, regardless, if it's spinning or casting, it's important to select one with plenty of backbone. Now my choice is a five and a half foot rod with about a 20% tip and about 80% backbone. An action I refer to as a fast action or a 2080 action. 
That's a rod with 20% tip action that allows for better control on the cast and super sensitivity that lets you feel the bottom terrain as you work the worm along. The 80 is the 80% backbone that allows you to load the rod on the cast for better distance and accuracy. But the key to this 80% is you'll get much better hook penetration and naturally land more fish. What takes place on the hook set is that the rod absorbs a tremendous amount of shock. Therefore, the lighter the action, the more the rod gives and absorbs. I honestly believe if you're having trouble getting the proper hook set and you try a fast action rod, you'll be amazed at the results. Okay, let's discuss how you rig this effective thing. There are many different ways to rig and fish the plastic worm, but the most popular by far is the slip sinker rig, which consists of a worm, a slip sinker, and a hook. Rigging the worm is simple. First, slide the sinker on, then tie on your hook. Hold the worm by the head and insert the point of the hook into the top part of the worm head until the barb is submerged. Then bring the hook out, pulling it down and turning it around just before the eye of the hook goes into the head of the worm. Then pinch the worm on the egg sac, pushing it forward and insert the point and barb into the worm. It's important that the worm is straight with the line at all times. If it's not, it'll begin to twist your line and cause you to hang. Uh oh, here we go. Oh, look at the pull of this big thing. There he come. Boiling that water. Good night. I'm holding with all my power. He don't like it at all. I don't like it. Me pulling on his face. You like me pulling on your face? All right, be stupid. Keep your mouth closed. What are you talking about? Getting it down in his face. There we go. Didn't hurt you a bit. Say bye. Okay, once you get it rigged, it's ready to fish. What you want to do, you want to cast it out naturally, and you want to let it settle to the bottom. Once it settles to the bottom, you want to begin your retrieve by letting the rod tip work the worm, putting the natural life action into the worm itself. Impart slight twitching actions as you work the rod tip from about the 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock position. And another thing you want to do, as you work it up from about 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you always want to concentrate and you want to watch what that line is doing at all times. That's very, very important. As you move it up, you want to watch the line as the worm settles back to the bottom, dropping the rod back, letting it settle back. And you want to repeat this motion over and over again until you have fished the area out. Cast it in, let it settle to the bottom or to the top of the cover, whatever you're fishing. But as it settles, you can watch your line with an inverted V as that line moves away from you. But once it hits the bottom, it'll fall back to you, the line will. Once it hits the bottom, again, you want to put the natural life action of that worm, make it come alive with that rod tip and the way you work that wrist. Working it from about the 10 o'clock to the 12 o'clock position. And then watching your line as it falls, you're taking up the slack. You're letting it fall back. You're starting that motion again up to about 12. Real slow like, dropping it back. But you're in total concentration on what that worm is doing at all times. And that's very, very important. With a sensitive tip rod, you'll be able to feel what that worm is doing at all times. That's why we talk about the fast action rod. 20% tip action for sensitivity, 80% backbone to really get a good hook set when you set the hook. On the retrieve, if you should feel the worm climbing up and through cover or over it, it's smart to jig it up and down gently before moving it on. This little piece of advice will pay off tremendously when bass are inactive. Whoa, 
little bit. Okay, now let's discuss that all-important question. When is the best time to set the hook? Boom, that quick. <laughs> but really not that quick. Now when I feel that tap, that bump, that thump, or the strike itself, the worm is usually on the fall. And my rod tip is somewhere between the 12 and 1 o'clock position. Now, if my arms were about 6 or 7 feet long, I could set the hook from that position. But the fact that my arms are not that long, and with the rod tip at about the 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock position, I really wouldn't have any setting power. Therefore, as soon as I feel that hit, or I see my line twitch, I instantly apply just a little bit of pressure. And as I begin doing that, I'm taking up the slack, and at the same time, I'm lowering my rod tip back to about the 10 o'clock position, depending upon which side of the boat. If I'm fishing one side of the boat, I'd be dropping it back to the 2 o'clock position. The other side, naturally, the 10 o'clock position. Now, by applying a little bit of pressure, this tells me a couple of things. First, it tells me that there's something alive on the other end of my line out there. And the second thing it tells me, it tells me which direction the fish is moving. Plus, it feels natural to the fish, making him hold on tighter, as if he was trying to escape, to get away from him. Now, once I've taken up the slack, and I drop my rod tip back to the 10 o'clock position, I set the hook with a strong upward jerk. From the first time I feel that tap, or that bump, or that thump we discussed, to the time I, boom, set that hook, takes just about three seconds. I'm not going to let him swim with the worm, swim off with it, because what that does, it takes the chance of moving more catchable fish from that location, Secondly, it takes the chance, or I take the chance, of the fish bushing me, running me off in cover, or a fish that I would release swallowing the bait. So, the important thing from the time you feel the hit to you add the pressure, taking up the slack to the time you set the hook, takes just about three seconds. I can't overemphasize the sensitivity in a rod tip, because it can sure make the difference. vegetation. You've got to feel what that worm is doing at all times to be able to fish it effectively. I get the best hook set by setting the hook with my rod in an upward position, using only my wrist and forearm, bringing the reel into my chest. This way, I have full control of the fish. If he runs to the right toward cover, I'm in a position to pull him left. If he goes left, naturally, I'm in a position to pull him to the right. And if he lunges down, I'm ready to go with him or pull him back. Come up here. Okay, now just calm down. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get real smart and get tough there. It'll be easy on your little face. I know it didn't hurt you much at all. Speaking of setting a hook, let's talk about worm hooks. And let me show you an illustration and explain to you why one style of worm hook seems to work better for plastic worm fishing. In this illustration, we have pictured two different styles of worm hooks. Both are the same size, three alt. The key difference between these hooks is that one is a sprout, the other is not. Of the two, the sprout is my number one choice. And let me tell you why. I feel with a sprout style, you'll increase your hook sets by 50% because there's less steel to drive through the worm and into the mouth of the fish. Now, look at the distance from the barb to the throat on the sprout hook opposed to the other style. There's a shorter distance on the sprout, which will definitely give you a quicker and give you much better hook penetration. Another key is that on many sprout style hooks, the steel diameter is smaller, which helps an angler maintain his maximum pounds of hook setting pressure. Example, it's much easier to push a straight pin into a potato than it is a nail. Something else that's very, very important is matching 
the hook size to the head diameter of the worm. Now when the hook is set on the strike, the worm slides down the hook shaft, forming a half knot in the throat of the hook. It applies pressure to the hook point and drives the point and barb through the worm into the mouth of the fish. If the hook is too small, the worm clogs the throat and gap of the hook and affects the hooking capabilities. Example, a one aught hook in an eight inch worm is too small. The proper size for this worm length would be a four aught and possibly a five aught. For worm lengths of four to six inches, I use primarily the one aught and two aught hook sizes. On worm lengths seven to eight inches, I normally use a three aught and a four aught size, and occasionally a five aught size, depending upon the diameter of the head of the worm. Now on nine to 12 inch worms in length, I use anywhere from a five to a seven aught hook. Now let's talk about this little thing, the slip sinker, and what its purposes are. A slip sinker has several purposes. One thing that it does, it gives you the added weight to get the worm out and down to the bottom. It also helps you feel the type of bottom that you're fishing as you work the worm along. And another thing it does, it helps you, or it helps the worm I should say, it protects the head of that worm as you bring it along in and around and through thick cover. And it slips when you set the hook, vibrating its way up the line several feet. This is important because it reduces the weight near the mouth of the fish. When he jumps or breaks water, or throwing his head from side to side, the less weight he has near his mouth makes it harder for him to throw it. If I've said this once, I've said it a hundred times. The lighter the slip sinker you can use and get away with, I honestly feel the more strikes you'll get. Why? Because 98% of the strikes occur as that worm is falling off of something or settling back to the bottom. And the more natural it looks, the more enticing it is. A lighter slip sinker will allow for a much slower natural fall than a heavier weight. Heavier slip sinkers in weights of 3 eighths to a half ounce size do have their place. Many times fishing deeper water or when it's extremely windy or there's a current, you'll need to increase the weight of the slip sinker to be able to feel the bottom or submerge cover. All I say is, whenever possible, fish the lightest weights you can. It'll make a major difference most times. There he is. Oh, he popped that thing. Oh, there you go. Coming up. Whoa, mister. Easy, 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 easy. Now watch him, watch him keep his mouth closed. Here we go. What about worm colors? That is a good question. Do they make a difference? Well, I sure do think so. You know, there are more color selections in worms than you can imagine. And believe it or not, they'll all catch fish at one time or the other. Now, I basically use five colors most of the time. Black, blue, purple, lime, and red. Occasionally, I'll use two-tone colors, especially in murkier water. My choice here is lime with a fire tail and black or grape with a fire tail. I've had great success with these two colors in off-colored water. The fire tail adds extra reflection to attract bass. The five basic colors I use are used in most cases as follows. Black for night fishing, purple or black for early, late, and cloudy days, blue and red, and sometimes lime for bright days for reflection in clear water. The fish hit that thing and drop it. Oh, there he is again. Hit it. There he is. There he comes. Wow, look at that. Boys and girls, look at Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill. Can you believe that thing taking it? All right now. All right, come on. I don't want to wear you down to where you get paralyzed. Say goodbye.
Another important thing about worm fishing is that bass can become very selective in their feeding habits. And this is when the length of the worm can make all the difference in the world. Now normally, during the early spring, I'll use, say, a four to six inch worm. And I have pretty good success with it. But as the season progresses, I will graduate to a little bit larger size worm. Let's say a seven to eight inch worm. But later in the year, by late summer, I find that I'll do much better, say with worms nine, 10, 11, even 12 inches long. And have seen many a time that bass would reject the smaller offering, say a six inch worm, be on a school of fish, and would reject the six inch size and would clobber a big 10, 11, or 12 inch worm. Let's talk about knots. With all the different types of knots to tie, fishermen can get a little confused. Your line is only as good as the knot you tie, and that's why it's important to learn how to tie a couple of good simple knots that have a breaking strength of about 98 to 100 percent. And two of my favorites that are very easy to learn and very easy to tie are the double loop clinch and the popular palomar. The double loop clinch, by the way, is the very first knot I ever learned to tie back when I was a youngster, and even today, I use it all the time. Here's how to tie it. Take the tag end and run it through an O-ring, a line tie, or the eye of a hook twice. Then twist it around the main line five times. Then bring the tag end down through the two loops you formed and pull it up snug and cut off the excess line. The most critical aspect of this knot is how many turns you take around the standing part. Five turns are the correct number. If you use less than five turns, you sacrifice knot strength, and if you exceed five, it becomes much more difficult to tighten the knot properly. When the knot isn't completely tightened, it will slip under pressure and then break. Now the Palomar knot is equally as good as the double loop clinch, and for many folks, it's easier to tie than the clinch. And if you tie it properly, you can achieve 100% knot strength. Like the double loop clinch, it's used to attach hooks, swivels, a lure, or barrel sinkers to the line. It's tied by doubling the tag end back against the standing part and insert the double line through the eye of the hook. Now, tie a simple overhand knot with a double line, but don't tighten it. Slip the loop of line far enough to pass it over the hook, the swivel, or lure, or whatever you're using and make sure the loop passes completely over this attachment. Okay, now pull steadily to tighten the knot and be careful that the loop slips past the eye of the hook. Pull both the tag end and standing line to tighten it and then clip off the tag end. Remember, there's no need to use elaborate or complicated knots when simple knots will do the job. Now, here's a tip that can really pay off. There are times when fishing a slip sinker worm rig that you'll need to keep it pegged against the head of the worm, especially when fishing it in heavy cover. And here's a little tip on how to peg it. Break off a strand of rubber from a spinner bait, a jig skirt, or even a rubber band. Tie onto your line above the weight by making one wrap and then three overhand knots. Pull tight. Slide them down snug against the weight. What this method does, it gives you a couple of advantages over pegging the slip sinker with a toothpick. First thing, the line is not weakened by being pinched against the lead, which can bruise the line and cause it to break on a hook set. Secondly, it can be easily unpegged without affecting the line or the slip sinker. You know, sometimes I fish a worm. I guess I fish it a little bit too fast, but it, all I'm trying to do just touch the bottom, lift it up, touch the bottom, just kind of making it just like that. And a little kind of a swimming action, but I'm stopping it, letting it settle right back to the bottom. But the key again, I'm working it with the rod tip, say opposed to the reel. In other words, I'm trying to create the natural life action of that worm with that rod tip, letting it fall right back, just easing it up from about 10 o'clock on up to about 12 o'clock, and then letting it settle back, taking up my slack. You 
yeah, there's nothing unusual, nothing wrong. You think a fish is there, sometimes six, eight cast, as many as six, eight cast at the same spot. Nothing wrong in that. You've got confidence in the spot, fish it that way. I honestly believe there's a fish right there. And I've made several casts to it. And there he is. Ooh. There he was. I know that hook is sharp. It's important to remember to periodically check your hook for sharpness. And one of the best ways is to try this little test on your hook to see if it's as sharp on the point as you think it is. First, pinch the eye of the hook with your thumb and index finger. Hold it so lightly that the hook almost falls from your fingers. Next, touch the point of the hook at about a 45 degree angle to your thumbnail. Touch it so lightly that only the weight of the hook itself is pressing down. Now, pull on the hook without pulling downward. If it slips or scratches your thumbnail, it's not sharp enough. And it's time to get out your hook honer and sharpen it up. However, if it digs immediately at the point of contact, it's ready to be bitten. This little device employs a high-speed orbital-driven diamond pad, which slowly rotates within a tubular bearing around the hook point. The user simply inserts the hook point into the small hole at the end of this tube, pushes the on button, and the instrument creates a perfectly round point within three short seconds. Ooh, look. Where are you going? Hard pulling this fish I ever saw in my life. Okay, now just calm down. I'm not gonna. I want to get real smart and get tough there. I'm gonna be easy on your little face. I know it didn't hurt you much at all. As I said a little while ago, there are numerous methods and lures with which to catch the largemouth bass. But to most bassing men, the phrase, there he is, is the big thrill in bass fishing. That tap is what it's all about. At that moment, the cares of the world are forgotten. Now, many folks set higher goals in the game of life. It may be hitting it big in the stock market, flying to the moon, or climbing tall mountains. My goal is to share with you the only life I know, and that's fishing. We'll see you next time.